Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're asking what would happen if trees didn't exist? What if trees didn't exist? Like, oh man, we'd have to find a new place to put our tree houses. <laughs> would they just be called ground houses? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we'll find out what else would have to change on our planet if we didn't have trees and figure out how forests change in a changing world. I'm excited we're doing another, like, what if this didn't exist episode. Yes, it's one of our favorite types of episodes that we do. And we've answered questions from kids about what it would be like if there was no moon or if we didn't have animals. And we found out that there's a lot of things that are essential to life on Earth. Yeah, you should definitely check those out if you haven't listened already. So we do get a lot of questions from kids about what if something didn't exist. And this time, not one, but two Tumble listeners emailed us about what the world would be like without trees. So I guess that means we kind of had to do this one. So let's start with our first listener, Rowan. My name is Rowan, and I'm seven years old. My question is, what would happen if trees didn't exist? I think that it would be hard to live because there wouldn't be that much air. All right, that's a great one from Rowan. So what's our second listener question? Nisha emailed us with the same question. Let's let her explain what she thinks the answer is and how scientists would find out. I think the answer is like the animals would be gone and the water would be less clean because the dirt could more easily get in and be blown into it without the tree roots. And I think scientists could find out the answer by looking at like places with their um, trees already cut down and seeing what the ecosystems there look like. I think Rowan and Nisha have some really great ideas there. It sounds like they're saying trees provide a lot of the things that Earth needs to be a good place for us to live. I agree. So let's ask our listeners, what do you think would happen if trees didn't exist? And how do you think scientists would find out? We'll be back with a scientist who will get to the root of the issue. To answer Rowan and Nisha's question, I called Angelica Patterson. My name is Angelica Patterson. So did you just call up your cousin or something? What's what's going on there? <laughs> no, Angelica is a Patterson of no relation. We just share the same awesome last name. There's a lot of Pattersons out there. So Angelica is a plant ecophysiologist. A plant what? Ecophysiologist. And so if you break down those words, we have plant, and then we have eco, and then we have physiology. Okay, so... I've definitely heard of plants, and I've heard of eco, like what you call a dryer if it's efficient. <laughs> but what's physiology? Physiology references how things work, basically. The study of how things work. Okay, so let me get this straight. A plant ecophysiologist studies ways to use plants to make dryers more efficient. <laughs> no. They study how plants work in the environment. And the plants that Angelica studies are trees. She got interested in trees because she found out that they can move. They can move? Like they can help get furniture from one city to the next? <laughs> That's not exactly what she means. Plants can move and migrate. I was like, how does, that, how does that happen? How does that work? And why is that happening? So wait, so like trees migrate like geese? Do they form like flying V formations and go south <laughs> in the winter? <laughs> We're going to get back to that later in the episode. But first, let's hear what Angelica says about what the world would be like if trees didn't exist. So if we do not have plants or we don't have trees, we won't have oxygen. OK, so that's like what Rowan said. There'd be less air to breathe. Right. And that's thanks to photosynthesis, the process by which plants make their own food. Plants use sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide to get energy. And photosynthesis releases oxygen into the air. So if trees didn't exist, there'd be less photosynthesis, and it would be harder for other living things to live. Exactly. And so without trees, we wouldn't have animals, we wouldn't have insects. Okay, so like Nisha said, there'd be no animals. 
Right. And Angelica also said that Nisha was right on the money with her idea that water would be less clean because tree roots help keep soil from running in to waterways. We want clean waters. And if you don't have clean waters, that's going to also affect the life that's within the waters, and that's fish. Oh my gosh. So I know that not having trees would affect life on land, but I wouldn't imagine that it could affect fish, too. Yeah, most people would think that fish wouldn't miss trees, but they'll feel the effects of them being gone. Think about, you know, there are things like all the benefits we get from trees. Angelica told me there's also a ton of products that we get from trees that we'll really miss. Yeah, like paper and all the things we make with wood, like IKEA furniture. And the food that we get from trees, like fruits, and my favorite kind of syrup, maple syrup. I just don't want to live without it. Okay, so that's painting a picture of a world with no trees, and it quite frankly sounds kind of not nice. But like, obviously, we live in a world that has trees, and could we lose them? That's a great question. We'll find out why trees are in danger and why Angelica ended up shooting trees with a shotgun to study a forest. Wait, what? Right after this quick break. We're back. So we've learned about why trees are so important to life on Earth. Now let's find out why a scientist would shoot them. (laughs) Yeah, I'm really wondering why a scientist who claims to like trees would spend her time shooting them. Okay, well, let me show you this video that Angelica sent us of her shooting a tree. Just a warning, you'll hear the sound of a gunshot in the clip, but it is safe and it is for science. All right, I'm opening it up. Here it is. (laughs) It's good she's wearing bright orange. That's nice. She's aiming straight up. She's aiming a gun straight up at the sky. Ah! Oh my gosh. That was loud. I think my favorite part of the video is her smile at the end. She It just says, like, that was so much fun. <laughs> you know, I've never tried to shoot a tree. <laughs> Do not try it. I mean, this is official scientist tree shooting for science and not meant to be done at home. Got it. So why is a scientist shooting at a tree? Well, in the video, Angelica is shooting branches down from the tops of a tree. Oh, because those are like attacking people. (laughs) No, no. There is a much better reason. But to explain it, we have to back up a little bit. So remember that at the beginning of this episode, we talked about how Angelica studies how trees move or migrate. Yeah, and that's where you told me that they don't form flying V formations, which would explain why I've never seen that. (laughs) Well, the reason why trees move has a lot to do with one of the biggest things that scientists are concerned about for the future of trees' existence. That is climate change. Climate change is basically the long-term change that we are seeing in our environmental conditions. The climate has always been changing on Earth, but it's speeding up as human activities add greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, causing our planet to get warmer faster. And scientists are concerned that trees won't be able to keep up with the changes in climate. Oh, okay. So Angelica wanted to know how forests were actually dealing with it. And I wanted to know what was happening in my backyard. At the time, Angelica was living in New York State, in the Northeast U.S., near a very special kind of forest. It's called an experimental forest, where scientists collect data about every single tree that lives in the forest, going back for many, many years. For 90 years, they had this great amount of record keeping. And when you looked at that, at the records, you noticed that Some trees that used to exist didn't exist anymore. Wait, trees didn't exist anymore? I mean, that's like the kid's question. What does that even mean if the forest is still there? Well, just like the climate, the forests were changing. And by changing, I mean trees migrating into the forest over time. And there were tree species that were leaving the forest over time. Oh, so that's how trees move. They're not flying. (laughs) They're they're not like uprooting and taking to the air. (laughs) Yeah, and it's not like just one tree or whoever wants to go south. It's the whole species 
depending on how the conditions are changing. I wondered if the reason they're doing that is because they can't tolerate the temperatures, you know, the ones that are leaving. Is it because they can't tolerate the climate that is is coming in? I mean, that definitely makes sense. So does this explain why she's out there shooting trees? That's still like a little bit of a plot hole for me. (laughs) Oh, oh, we're getting there. So (laughs) in the video, Angelica is actually standing in the experimental forest. But before she got to the actual trees, she looked at maps of them. So I was able to look at their historical maps of where these trees used to live. She categorized the trees into northern, southern, or central trees based on their range or where they lived across North America. And so that's how I was able to kind of compile a list. Using her list, Angelica had to find a way to see which tree species were growing the fastest so she could compare how they were doing. And if they're growing faster, that probably means they're going to be more healthy. And it's a really good environment for them to grow. So did she like just take out a measuring tape and see how high the trees are? It seems like that might be hard if they're like really tall. (laughs) Yes. And also because tree growth is not just about being tall. The best measure is actually through their leaves. So Angelica had to go around the forest and collect or sample leaves from all the different species on her list. For my research, it was really important for me to sample leaves that were growing very high in the canopy. Um, And by canopy, I mean the top of the tree. Okay, so I think I can see where this is going, but why she got to get the highest leaves? Like, couldn't she just get lower ones that are easier to reach? The reason why is because we know that plants photosynthesize at the leaf level, and depending on where the leaf is on the tree, whether it's way on top or way on the bottom, they photosynthesize at different rates. Wait, not all leaves are photosynthesizing the same? That's like saying you're like, my right leg's really fast, but my left goes slow. Okay, well, when it comes to trees, leaves that get a lot of sunlight at the top of the tree actually have different shapes from leaves at the bottom of the tree in the shade. And those top leaves are built to photosynthesize faster. So I had to get up there. <laughs> I, had to, I had to figure out how, how do I get those? leaves on the top of the tree. Okay, so like all the trees she's dealing with are like big, big, tall ones, like not little babies. Nope, they're like 50 feet or 15 meters tall. So Angelica had a few options to pull down branches with the leaves that she wanted. You can climb a tree, you can use a ladder, you can use a slingshot, which I did. Wait, So is this like a science slingshot? (laughs) It is a science slingshot, but it still is pretty DIY. (laughs) But I was really horrible at that. And it took a very, very long time. Okay, so I guess the science slingshot didn't work. So what did she do? So what we did was I was introduced to using a shotgun. All right, finally, we get to the shotgun. Like, is this normal scientific practice or is this just something she's doing for fun? (laughs) (laughs) It turns out that shooting branches down is something that scientists do for science. This method of using a shotgun to shoot down branches that are high up is actually not new. Plenty of ecophysiologists, plant ecophysiologists have used this method and they continue to use this method. Okay, so are scientists like good good shots? <laughs> Angelica was. I was actually pretty good at it. I was pretty skilled at it. Depending on the angle, I would probably need maybe one or two uh, shots to get uh, one of those branches down. And then we will move on to the next tree. All right, well, so now this is making more sense. And I understand it's not about stopping the attacking trees. Right. When the branches landed on the ground, Angelica picked them up and put them in a bucket of water to keep them alive so that the leaves would keep photosynthesizing. And then we brought those branches back to the lab where we put the leaves into a portable photosynthesis machine. Okay, you know, we're really getting deep into our inventory right now. <laughs> There's a lot of equipment here. A portable photosynthesis machine? Is that like an iron lung for leaves that keeps them on 
leaf, support. Good one. What it actually does is measure the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of the leaf. And that allowed Angelica to find an answer to her question. Is the new climate that's at the forest better for the plants that are actually migrating in from the south? In other words, were trees coming in from warmer climates doing better in the forest than trees that were used to the older, colder climate? So what did she find? With the trees that I studied, we did find differences in their rates of photosynthesis, how fast they're growing. Angelica matched up her list of trees with the data she got from their leaves, and then she compared them to make her conclusion. And we are seeing a pattern between trees that are perhaps migrating out of the forest and trees that are coming in. So does that mean the old trees are dying? Not quite. Angelica says the older trees are still doing okay alongside the new trees. They're still kind of comparable to each other. The forest that Angelica studied seems stable for now. And while it may look different in the future, climate change is not going to transform the forest overnight. Usually, the big changes that happen in a forest requires big changes to happen in general. So what kind of big changes is she talking about here? Is there changes that could suddenly transform the landscape, like wildfires or deforestation, which is what happens when people cut down trees and don't replant them? It's harder for a forest to change if the trees are already there. But if there's a forest fire that comes through, or a large construction project that takes down trees, what grows back is going to be probably more drastic than a forest that is already established. Yeah, so that's actually what Nisha thought scientists might study, forests that have already been cut down. Yeah, scientists do also study how forests recover like after wildfires. But Angelica chose to study an experimental forest to find out how trees can be resilient or able to withstand or overcome difficulty. I know we live in a changing world and being able to go outdoors and understand, you know, how these trees are experiencing all these factors that can really answer that question, like how do trees die or what if we don't have any trees? To understand how these trees are responding to all of these pressures, is just fascinating. And I learned more and more about how adaptable and resilient these living organisms are. In other words, we want to learn how to help trees stick around, continue existing, so that we can have clean air and clean water and all the other great things that we've learned forests do for the planet. And of course, your favorite, maple syrup. Of course. Now that you've learned how Angelica studied a forest in her own backyard, here's how she recommends studying what's in your own backyard. Take a notebook and go outside. Whether you have your own yard or go to a nearby park, you can even look at the view just outside your window. Write down everything that you see, including plants, animals, the weather outside that day. Sketch a picture, take a landscape, or even a detailed drawing of a plant. Do the same thing day after day, whenever you get the chance. What changes can you observe, and what questions do you have about those changes? When you're asking those questions, you're thinking like a scientist. If you try this out, show us a page from your notebook. Send a photo to tumblepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to see it. Thanks to Dr. Angelica Patterson, Curator of Education and Outreach at the Miller Worley Center for the Environment at Mount Holyoke College. If you want to know more about Angelica and what she's learned by shooting at trees, go visit our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. We'll have the video there as well. Sarah Robertson Lentz is our editor and designed the episode art. Chad Chennai is the assistant producer on this episode. Gary Calhoun James is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode, and I'm also the executive producer of Tumble. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Science discovery.